It is especially good to be here with some good news. Now, you know how the party and I as energy spokesman have been banging on and banging on about the issue of energy and climate for years now, it seems, for a very long time. And I'm here to tell you today that the message is finally getting through. As Diane James has just mentioned, it seems that David Cameron, our Prime Minister, has had a bit of a change of heart. He has called for us to cut the green crap. Good heavens, Prime Minister. Well, we like the words, but uh, maybe you'd actually better get on and do it. But it's not just here in Britain that we have this situation, oh no. The message is also starting to get through in the European Union. Now, we have an energy commissioner in the European Union. He's a very nice German man called Mr. Günther Oettinger. And what does Mr. Günther Oettinger say? He says, we cannot continue in Europe to pursue a unilateral climate policy. Well, you know, Europe loves to lead. The problem with leading is that nobody is following. <laughs> and my question for Mr. Günther Oettinger is, good news, fella, but why did it take you so long to work it out? And it is not just Mr. Günther Oettinger because one of his colleagues in the College of Commissioners in the Berlaymont building is another nice man called Antonio Tajani, who is the Commissioner for Industry. And what does Mr. Antonio Tajani say? He uses very strong language for a European Commissioner. He says the EU faces an industrial massacre. Now that is strong language but it's not overstrong because it is absolutely true. And bear in mind that Britain, so help us at the moment, is part of this European Union. We too are facing an industrial massacre as a result of energy prices. And it's not just politicians and European commissioners. It's even former green activists. James Lovelock uh, was a, 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 a darling child of the environmental movement. He was a founder member of Greenpeace. He wrote a book called Gaia uh, that I thought was a bit uh, over-imaginative, but proposing uh, all sorts of environmental ideas. Now, he still believes that CO2 emissions are a problem, uh, so we need to convert him on that one, but he's actually realized what we have been saying for a long time, and that is this that even if you believe CO2 emissions are a problem, the things we are doing to solve the problem simply don't work. So James Lovelock is saying we ought to be putting more effort into nuclear and less effort into wind farms. He said on Channel 4 News just a few days ago, they've stopped building nuclear and started building wind farms instead. I think they're mad. And ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think they're mad too. He also said, on the same programme, he said, I think shale gas makes sense, it'll help Britain to muddle through. And I haven't seen my good friend Stuart Agnew uh, in the conference yet, I, perhaps he's here. Ah, oh, Stuart, good. This one's for you, this one's for you. Lovelock also says he supports GMO technology. Uh, to feed a hungry planet. <laughs> so we have a whole list of people in politics and elsewhere who are starting to realise that the things we are doing with wind farms aren't going to work. Now, the old parties have worked out a strategy to deflect criticism. Their strategy is to blame the power companies. They say this is all about the power companies who are gouging the consumer and pushing up prices uh, and uh, uh, they ought to be giving money back. Now, bear in mind, these are the power companies we're relying on to fund massive new energy infrastructure without which our economy will grind to a halt. So I'm here today to tell you it is not the fault of the power companies. If you look at their report and accounts, you will find that their return on capital employed is much the same as any other large company. It is the policies. It is the policies that governments and Brussels are putting in place. That is what is creating the problem, the, the money we are investing, spending, wasting uh, on renewables. Now, if we had the Greens here, of course, if we had Ed Davey, that nice man, he'd be saying, he'd be saying, hang on a minute, Roger, you're ahead of yourself here. He'd be saying, 
less than half of the price rises uh, are down to renewable energy uh, and green taxes and subsidies. Actually, most of it, he would say, is the result of fossil fuel prices. And they're determined globally. There's nothing we can do about them. Oh, yes, there is. We have chosen to use expensive Russian gas when we could be using much cheaper coal. That is one of the choices we have made to force up fossil fuel prices. And we could, of course, uh, be looking for cheaper indigenous gas rather than importing uh, expensive Russian gas. These are choices which have been made by politicians which are driving up energy prices. So what are our current energy policies? And I've said here, I think, Britain's current energy policies, but of course, they are imposed from Brussels by the European Union's climate and energy package. We're getting two main results. We are undermining the competitiveness of British industry and we are driving energy intensive industries offshore, taking their jobs and their investment with them. And they are often going, ladies and gentlemen, to other jurisdictions with lower environmental standards. I am told that to make a ton of steel in China, you actually emit twice as much CO2 as if you made the same ton of steel in Britain. But you can't make the same ton of steel in Britain because you can't afford the energy. So we are driving the jobs and the investment and the industry out of this country, and we are increasing global emissions of CO2 at the same time. Where is the sense in that? Now, you probably know, if you read my blog, and I hope you do, you probably know that I'm always banging on about energy-intensive industries. Well, what are these energy-intensive industries? And bear in mind, we have a government that says we become over-dependent on services. We want to rebalance the economy towards industry. Well, let me tell you about some industries. Metals, aluminium smelting, steel and other metals. Very, very energy-intensive businesses. Cement uses a huge amount of energy. Glass, another big energy industry. Chemicals wood pulp and paper processing, even petroleum refining. You think of petroleum refining as providing fuel to put in your car, but the actual refining process uses a large amount of energy. Nobody in their right mind in the oil industry would put up a refinery in Britain or in Europe today because it is much cheaper to put it in America or India or China and ship the refined petroleum products into this country. So again, We've moved the industry and the jobs offshore. We've driven away the added value and given it to somebody else. Is that smart? No, it is sheer lunacy. <laughs> but as John Bickley has already pointed out to us, it is not just a case of industry. It is people and homes and households and pensioners. Is there anybody here who has not received an electricity bill in the last six months? I shouldn't think so. You will have seen for yourselves the price we are paying for electricity. We know the number of people who are being forced into fuel poverty. We know that pensioners particularly are suffering. We know that there are excess deaths in the winter. In this country, a developed country, uh, what we regard as a rich country, there are pensioners who die in the winter because they are cold and they have had to choose between heating their homes and putting food on their plates, and that is not acceptable. <laughs> now, we've heard a bit today about the issue of flooding, and we've seen the problems that have taken place in the Somerset levels and the Thames Valley and around here, and some people in the media are saying, well, this is proof. Global warming it must be the result of global warming. Well, I have to tell you that one wet winter does not constitute proof of global warming, especially when there has been no global warming for the past 17 years. But the fact is that even the IPCC, and I rarely quote the IPCC, but I will this time, the IPCC has said there is no demonstrable link between climate change, as they call it, and flooding. And it is wholly irresponsible of our prime ministers to say that in his opinion, he thinks there might be a link. He should get his facts right first. If he believes the IPCC about global warming, surely he can believe them when they say it has nothing to do with floods. As you will know, I have argued extensively that there are big doubts whether human activity in fact have a significant effect uh, on climate at all, and we don't have time to go into that in any detail. 
But the third point to remember, whether you believe in climate change as a result of CO2 or not, the fact is that the money we are wasting on wind farms and solar panels will not have any significant effect on the climate at all. The But I will tell you, I will tell you what would have had an effect on the floods if we had taken a tiny fraction, if we had taken 1% of the money we have wasted on wind farms, and if we had spent that on dredging the Somerset levels. Oh dear, I've got the flashing light too. Um, I, uh, I was in a debate with Labour MEP Richard Hewitt um, uh, just through this week on BBC News uh, and I mentioned the effect of European directives causing the flooding and he hooted with derision and he said you're telling us now that the EU caused the rain. I said no Richard I didn't say the EU caused the rain but I say that the Habitat Directive and the Water Framework Directive have prevented us from managing the Somerset levels and the worst of it is worse than that the EU Waste Directive. The silt that we take out of that dredging and farmers used to put on their fields as free green fertilizer, we now have to treat as waste and we have to put in landfill. That is what is happening. And I'm getting, getting my papers confused now. It's your flashing light, Chairman. This is the problem. <laughs> let, me, let me conclude. Let me conclude. We do have an election just coming, and I wasn't going to miss that entirely. We have strong messages, strong messages on these issues. Uh, for the doorstep. The first message is whether or not you believe in climate change, the policies we are pursuing now will mortgage our children and bankrupt our grandchildren. They are doing huge harm to our economy and costing us jobs and costing us prosperity. The other message is that UKIP is the only party which has a rational policy for secure and affordable energy. That is where we stand. That is UKIP's energy vision. Let's go out and win the election.